Has it started? It's working. Oh, yeah, perfect. Okay. Hi, everyone, um, and welcome to our April session of reproducibility. And we're delighted today to be joined by Relitza Madsen from UCL. Uh, she's based, she's a postdoctoral research fellow based at the UCL Cancer Institute. And today she's going to be telling us about selfish reasons to start using our space as, as an electronic notebook and, and how it can really be a valuable tool for reproducible workflows. Uh, so I'll hand it over to, to Relitza and we'll get the session started. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody, and thank you, Neve and Laura, for the invitation to give my take on our space in the context of reproducible workflows. Uh, so I usually tend to give, or more recently, I've started giving some of these um, open science talks, which tend to be a little bit more preachy. So I'm quite looking forward to giving a practical uh, talk. So as you'll see, there won't be that many slides, and I'll be showcasing some examples of how I'm using our space um, in my daily research. Um, so a brief outline on what I'm going to cover. Um, the first three points are really going to take uh, maybe maximum five minutes. So a bit of a general um, reason, or a, a bit of general reasons why you would uh, want to consider using ELNs, not just our space. Uh, there are obviously many other options. And then how does our space uh, compare to other ELN solutions? Uh, and some of my own uh, thoughts and advice on how you can streamline adoption of, a, of um, an ELN uh, and use it efficiently as a lab. And I don't have a lab, but I've been uh, quite heavily involved in um, engaging and, and, and promoting uh, data uh, management uh, practices, good data management practices in my previous lab and current lab. So I've got some maybe tips uh, based on uh, my own experience for what has worked and what hasn't worked that well. So really the main part of, of my um, talk will be a hands-on demonstration of uh, reproducible um, RSpace workflows. And I should say this is not an RSpace tutorial per se. Uh, if you do want an RSpace tutorial, you should contact uh, RSpace um, uh, themselves and look through their uh, frequently asked questions, etc. So I won't be able to cover every single uh, future of RSpace, but more which bits I found useful and how I'm integrating them in my, in my workflows. So why, why should you consider an ELN? I think uh, maybe the answer to that question is rather obvious and there are numerous advantages to using ELNs. Uh, I have listed uh, a few of them and I won't um, read them out. I know this is being recorded so people can come back to it and I'll, I'm happy to share the slides, but perhaps I'll highlight um, three uh, or four key uh, reasons why I think you should consider a switch to an ELN. First of all, time is money, and uh, you will find uh, that if you switch to an ELN, uh, you will save um, a lot of time on, first of all, trying to decode um, writing. You um, won't have to do that as you do in a conventional lab book, but also quite importantly, you can do, uh, you can search electronically. You have possibilities to integrate with other tools. When it comes to writing publications or thesis for those of you who are uh, doing PhDs or masters, you will find that it's much easier and much faster to retrieve the details that you need for your materials and methods. Um, when it comes to Collaborations, it also makes it much easier. First of all, you can uh, collaborate both with more efficiently both within and uh, outside the group. Uh, and um, that is particularly important when it comes to research continuity, which I know PIs will be particularly interested in. Uh, it just makes it so much easier for people to pick, pick up some research that has been done in the lab and to continue from there, provided, of course, that you have engaged in uh, reproducible workflows uh, when using um, your ELN on a daily basis. So we'll come back to that. Um, a final thing um, I want to mention is IP and commercialization, which I think a lot of academics are also uh, getting into nowadays. Um, for that to work out, for instance, patent filing, you do need to have extensive documentation um, and uh, evidence for version control and traceability in your work. So even if you can't foresee commercialization of your work in the immediate future, you never know what's going to happen down the line. So you better be prepared from um, an early start, and that's actually a place where our space has a bit of an advantage compared to some other solutions, given that it's what's called 21 CFR 11 compliant. So I've written it down because I never remember the exact word, um, but it's to do with um, um, details regarding IP and commercialization and stuff that's required by the FDA in the US. Um, worth having a look if you're interested. And of course, it's not bad for science either, but I, I promise no preaching, so I've put it um, down at the bottom as a side note. Um, 
so how does RSpace compare to other uh, tools that are out there? Um, this is a table that's taken from RSpace website um, itself, um, and RSpace adopted it from Harvard website and uh, there are many other solutions these are just a few benchling synode lab archives i don't have any experience with synode and lab archives uh, i did tend to use benchling uh, not as a lab book but as a replacement for snap teams so i don't have to pay a license so those of you who do molecular biology you will know what i'm talking about um our space have some has some advantages and of course coming from their own website those are the ones that will be highlighted um, but i broadly agree um, with them having a bit of an edge over some of their uh, competitors when it comes to the versatility of the platform ability to integrate with other apps uh, or external storage providers and uh, also uh, the fact that the storage, data storage is unlimited. A particularly nice feature, which is not actually highlighted here, is the ability to link uh, individual lab book entries together, and I'll provide examples uh, of that in my own um, usage. Um, I should mention that RSpace is uh, a web um, browser-based platform, so you will have uh, you will need access to the internet um, to 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 use it. Um, but uh, Benchling, for instance, is another one that's like that. And I'll come back to how um, you can work around potential issues if you don't have access to the Internet at a given point and you want to record some data. OK, um, so this is just an overview of uh, some of the um, the, eco the R space ecosystem, as they call it, so some of the, the, the modularity that the, that the platform offers. So I already mentioned some of these bits. Um, a lot of the stuff I probably haven't even used it myself yet, and something that's not even shown here is their recently um, released inventory, which may be useful if you are to adopt this as a lab solution. Um, some bits that I may not really highlight in the usage, as such, uh, you know, access to protocols IO, which I think is quite popular at Edinburgh as well, and I have used it uh, myself. Access to Mendeley. Uh, I'll show you how I'm using Office within our space, but particularly important for me at least is uh, the ability to integrate with um, external storage providers such as such as Dropbox. And if you do have the the enterprise version, you'll also be able to. Uh, link directly to your uh, university storage uh, servers, which will be really useful as well, as well and will also um, ensure that you can have internal uh, backup options. Right, um, probably worth mentioning this bit here as well, given that many funders and journals also now um, enforce data deposition as part of a publication workflow, um, so our space quite nicely links to uh, various uh, data repositories um, and you see here Dataverse, Fixture, DSpace. So um, it makes it quite easy to comply um, with these requirements. Um, to be honest, well, I, I would have to be to be honest with you, you know, it's not uh, one of those things where you just open a browser and then you just start using RSpace and it all flows seamlessly. There are, of course, some caveats. It's not all um, it's not always uh, as uh, maybe organized as you want it to be, but there have been major improvements since uh, I started using the platform two years ago, and I think it's fairly easy to get into now. Um, I would say think about the Pareto principle where you have to invest 20% of your time in getting up to speed with our space and how to use it efficiently as a lab and as an individual, and then you'll uh, be able to reap um, rewards uh, which accumulate so you're not going to you know see lots of gain necessarily on a daily basis but again coming to publications thesis writings etc uh, that's where you'll really see uh, the benefits so some tips um, when it comes to streamlining uh, our space adoption as a lab um, some of these will become less abstract as you uh, see my uh, usage examples but I would say try to think there in terms of the group. So I'm playing on words here, of course. Um, you've heard, I'm sure, about fair data, so data having to be findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. But I would say think about these terms in the context of your lab book entry. So are they findable? Are they accessible to anyone inside or outside the lab? Can someone just read through your lab book entry and then uh, move forward with their own experiments by reusing what you've done already? Um, that's very important. For that to work, I would recommend um, having 
one or several lab book entry templates. I'll show you some examples of what I mean with that. A notebook based project organization. Again, I'll come back to this in my example, um, but particularly important also to have some rules regarding data storage. You can't store all your data um, in our space. I certainly wouldn't recommend it um, if you have lots of images, for instance. Um, I would I, I think that becomes practically unreasonable. Um, so you know how you're going to link uh, with external data storage uh, sites. Are you going to provide some information in the lab book entry or direct links, etc.? It's important to think about. Um, and then also uh, consistent file naming rules, which is something we'll come back to as well. Finally, um, have a think about having generic rules regarding how often you would want to archive your R space. Um, entries. So I'll show you a really useful expert feature that basically archives everything at once and then you can save it in a in a lab folder that's accessible externally and that way you have this extra security provided in addition to obviously the backup options that um, our space uh, has. You, as you'll see, it auto saves all the time and there is great version control. So I think uh, maybe we should just go ahead um, and have a look at some uh, actual examples. So I'm currently using the community version. I have some experience with the enterprise version um, when I was in Edinburgh for a transition postdoc um, in 2018. Um, so really the um, uh, tools or the, um, what are they called? Um, Features that are available to you uh, via the community version uh, are very much the same as the enterprise version, but the enterprise version provides this additional integration with your, with your research institution, and you can find more information um, about that online as well. So let's switch to my art space. And if you see me looking to the side, it's because I've got a long list of things that I need to remember to highlight or mention. So I'm going to basically take off. Um, my list. Um, so what you're seeing here is my uh, workspace when I log into my um, R space community version. And um, you know you've got various uh, options. Um, you can access lab group records up here. Uh, you can um, access things that you've highlighted as, as favorites. You can send in messages um, to, to others uh, that you're working with in here. And you also have some notifications, um, which, um, for instance, if you've exported something and it's not ready to download, you, you, you'll get a message here. Now, if you look at my, on my R space, you do see some yellow bits, which are the, which are folders. And then you see these green bits here. The green bits, they are notebooks or R space notebooks. So this is what I mean in terms of having project specific uh, notebooks. So think about it a bit like the conventional paper lab book. Some people I know like to have a uh, lab book for each project that they're working on. Um, this is sort of the equivalent and I think it's something that becomes more important the more you progress in your career and you have to juggle multiple different projects. Um, even st basic stuff like optimizations and tasks, I have a lab book um, notebook for that. Uh, you see these information icons here uh, and if you click on those, you'll see that uh, the lab notebook has a unique ID. This is quite important because um, and more important when it comes to the lab book entries themselves, but it's important there's a unique ID because if I now change the name of this uh, notebook, the unique ID won't change. So this notebook is always linked to this ID, so I can always find it by knowing uh, the ID. Okay, um, I can share a notebook with others. Um, I can automatically share everything with the entire lab actually, uh, but uh, specifically uh, if I'm working together, this is a technician in the lab, for instance, and I've shared it, uh, my notebook with him and he's got edit rights so that when he does stuff for me, he can automatically update a relevant lab book entries. It's really useful when you have students as well. Um, so before, when it comes to reproducibility, uh, there are, you have to think about um, an electronic lab book as a space where you can uh, plug and play with different building blocks. So to make your workflows efficient, I would suggest that common protocols go into a folder called protocols, uh, and then you can have them divided according to different um, topics. So for instance, if I'm doing microscopy, cell culture, cloning, you see I have different, um, different folders for that. So let's go into the facts folder. And what you see here uh, is obviously the name of the, the protocol, and then you see the sign here. What this uh, means 
is that uh, my um, fax protocol for generic life source sorting has been shared with someone else. I can see whom I've shared this with by clicking on the information icon again, so this is my student. Uh, you can also see the unique ID here uh, and you can see something really useful down here, which is that this document is linked by three other documents. What this means is that I've basically plugged this protocol into three different uh, lab book entries. This is really useful because if it's a protocol that I'm using uh, more than just once, um, I can basically insert it into a relevant lab book entry. And then if there are certain modifications, I can say, follow this protocol, insert the link with the following modifications, and then I type those modifications. So basically, I can go into these lab book entries and I can find immediately um, how this protocol, in what context this protocol has been used. Um, so, oh, by the way, if anyone has any burning questions whilst watching any of this, please do, do interrupt me and ask. Um, Right, so cover protocols. Uh, if we now look at how I'm setting up my actual lab book entry, so let's go into some molecular biology. If you haven't figured it out yet, I do work on P3 kinase. Um, so R space teaching example. So actually, um, let me show you one other thing first. If you look down my um, the naming of my files, this is something that I sort of now decided uh, to do quite consistently. As you see, it wasn't necessarily the case um, in 2020, at, like exactly a year ago. But what I've now find, found works really well for me if I actually make sure that my lab book entries start um, with the unique entry of, uh, with unique ID of that particular um, art space document. So you see this ID here, SD1149310, um, is also how I'm starting this um, name um, of, of the file. And then I usually tend to include a date and then some generic description. Uh, people should have some flexibility in how they're naming things. So for instance, a generic description, um, you know, could be someone else might use something completely different, but actually having this convention um, to maybe start with the unique ID and a date is useful because first of all, it allows re very easy sorting uh, because the unique ID increases numerically because this is just internal to our space. So you can easily sort, you know, in descending or ascending order and you'll get the right, um, you'll get the right order automatically. It get, with dates, you tend to get that as well, uh, provided that people actually use the same date convention. Okay, so some people may like to start 7th April 2021. I've done 2021 April 07. So that can uh, change the sorting. Now, where is that useful? Uh, it's fine in our space. I could easily just have sorted and look at the ID here. But if we now go back to the way I'm organizing my experiments, you can see here that in my Dropbox, I actually start my folders with the unique ID uh, of the lab book entry to which a folder is linked. So as I said, I don't store all my data in our space. So any data that's stored on my computer, I want to have a very easy way to then go back to the lab book entry that's associated with that data. So by having the unique ID name uh, in, the, in the folder name on my computer, it's very easy for me to you know, switch between the two. Um, I do some bioinformatics as well, and when I start, for instance, an R script, I would also put um, the unique ID in, in the R script to say, okay, this data is based on experiment done, blah, 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 unique R space ID provided, and then I can easily go back to it. So this is what I meant with having some sort of convention when it comes to, to naming. It's also quite easy for PIs, I think, to then access um, work that has been done by their lab members and quite easily figure out what data is linked to uh, what experimental workflow. So let's have a look at this uh, teaching example. I'm, I'm okay on time, so I could probably even speak slower. Sorry about the um, gunshot speed of speaking. Um, right, so setting up an actual experimental entry, I I like to think about uh, a lab book entry as being a mini project or almost like a mini paper, if you like. So you have to think about others accessing your lab book entry and yourself maybe three years down the line. So what is the easiest and most efficient way of finding your way um, through it? So I've played around with a few different options and what I found most useful, especially also in collaborating with others in the lab, is to have some sort of convention that, okay, let's just start the lab book entry with a name. So we, we know exactly what this experiment is supposed to uh, achieve. Um, you know, it could be something like, okay, let me optimize 
uh, XYZ. Um, I often work with cells, um, so consider this my sort of material and method section of my lab book entry. So, you know, what are the cells? Where are they coming from? Um, I'll come back to this log here in a second. Uh, what are the cell culture reagents of you? So, you know, that makes it easy if you're a PI and you know that every single person in your lab uh, in your lab has followed some sort of template um, that has this sort of structure, you know, you know that, you know, the, the, the beginning is the aim, then you can find some materials and methods you can easily copy across to a paper uh, or to your thesis. Uh, then that makes it really easy to find your way around. So here I've been doing some molecular biology, so I've got my plasmid maps so I can easily download them. And, and and look at exactly uh, what type of um, DNA I've been using. Um, these some of these constructs. One of the constructs here it was generated uh, in another um, lab book entry. You know I've been doing some subtoning, so I can easily link to it here. The way you do that in our space is up here. You have insert internal link, and then you can search and browse for the entry that. Uh, is of relevance and it gets inserted and you can basically jump across to it. Sometimes you might want to have two entries open at the same time, so I tend to do that by just doing a uh, open link uh, in a new tab and that also works quite well. So okay, generic details up here, aim, materials and methods type of sort of um, uh, entries and then I've got my experimental node. So this is where I think there should be quite a bit of flexibility in terms of how people are setting it up. I think an analogy I was thinking about um, yesterday was it's a bit like having rules at home. You know, every child has got their rooms um, and there is some expectation that the rooms are relatively tidy, but you know, some will be messier than others. But generally speaking, uh, certain things will be the same. They will have a bed or whatever, you know. Um, make sure that's kind of I think that's useful to think about when it when it comes to to uh, streamlining ELN usage um, as a lab. So here you've got the experimental details and then at the end um, I like to have interpretation and comments and errors. As you see I haven't even filled it in yet for this because I'm still doing it. Um, but um, that's another useful way as a, you, as a PI you may be like you may be thinking okay there are a lot of details details blah 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 which are useful for maybe students. Um, or, or collaborators uh, picking up a protocol, but if you just want quick and to quickly understand, okay, what was the main outcome of this experiment? You know, you just have to scroll down. Um, so that's sort of um, the template um, that I've be use, been using in this context. Um, so, oh yes, an important thing: if you want to have a template, you know, I've set this up now in a document and I set it up as a as a table. Um, if you now want to make this uh, a sort of generic template up here, by the way, this what I'm doing here is I'm just switching to um, big screen and, and conventional view. Um, you can click on save and then you can say save as a template. And once you've done that, it will go into uh, your um, template folder, which is here. Um, so let's look at this one here because I will be covering it anyway. Um, so then I've got this template, which is always there, and then I can create documents based on this template. And sometimes you may just have filled in the cells with some examples so that you know, you know, if it's a student starting in the lab, they know um, what I mean by yeah, recording uh, passaging procedure or whatever. Um, so a cell culture log is actually quite useful, and I know that not um, everyone in the audience is a cell biologist. So if you're working with mice or humans, um, you can modify uh, this to your needs. But for instance, when it comes to cells and signaling studies, which is a lot of what I do, um, I find it quite useful to actually have a separate cell log that I can link to within my experimental entry. So you've got your Lot, uh, cell culture lock, which is almost like the fruit you're going into to get some common reagents. So this is a common entry that a lot of other entries will link into. And that cell culture lock should have details about, you know, what medium have you been using? Um, what is the um, materials, um, the catalog number, um, so that it's easy for your PI or yourself when you're writing stuff up to quickly retreat these. And then you've got the, the lock. Uh, oh, by the way, I also think it's really useful to have information about who's been involved in, in doing some some experiment, basically to for credibility purposes. But as you also see, uh, everything in in our space is version uh, controlled and and tracked. So changes will also um, who, whoever is changing something will also be recorded. Right. So then we've got the lock here. Uh, what, you know, date, by what cell line, what's been done to it, um, comments, micrographs. 
uh, we tend to take photos of some of our cells to record health. Uh, where this becomes useful, I'll show you an actual life example is if we go, you know, I'll have to do some gene editing um, and in MCF10A cells and I have this cell culture lock um, of, uh, to, to sort of demonstrate or um, check what the health of the cells uh, is uh, on a regular basis. Uh, but what's really useful is when you say you're seeding your cells for an experiment and you can say, OK, I've been seeding the cells also for this experiment. And then you insert a link to uh, this lab book entry and you can jump to it. And that way, these two entries are now linked together. So if you now have to troubleshoot your gene editing experiment and you're thinking, oh, maybe it didn't work because the cells were unhealthy, uh, you can go back and you can check, OK, what did the cell culture lock say? Uh, everything was fine or wasn't fine. So I find that quite useful. Um, as you can see, this requires some time and, and, and an effort to set it up and be as organized to, and, you know, record these details every day. But you have to think about the gain uh, again uh, long term. It's not going to be obvious immediately why you have to go through the hassle of reporting everything. Uh, but I would say it's partly how you should be as a scientist, but also down the line, it's going to make your life so much easier when you have to write stuff up. Um, so, um, mm -hmm see what uh, oh yes um if i now change anything here um blah 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 uh, then you'll see here auto saving so uh you don't have to worry about actually uh saving it's going to do it for you what uh you can um uh, what other information can you get from this unique ID uh, icon information icon? It's actually the version of your document. So that's what it shows you. Uh, that's where you know that um, the document is version control. So this is version 20. So every time a change is recorded, you will get um, update uh, an updated version. So if you accidentally overwrite um, this entry, um, the way it can happen is, especially with these more common template-like entries, you could have, you, maybe you thought, oh, I'm just going to save it and say clone to make a duplicate and then I'm going to edit it so it becomes a different entry. And then you don't realize you've actually just started editing the original one and suddenly it's all mixed up. It's happened to me once. Um, you can go back uh, and try to restore um, to a previous version because you have a complete overview of that. Um, I need to remind myself exactly where I did it. Sometimes a bit bug and play here. Um, So as you can see in, in my R space, you have like you, uh, you have an overview of uh, deleted items, shared documents, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think the restore option and I think someone from our space is here, so they're probably watching in horror. Um, but um, oh, I'll have to figure it out exactly uh, where my restore option was because I it's it's not very often that I need to use it, but it's, uh, it's yeah. there. Is someone intervening? Yeah, you have to go um, into the list mode of, or no, you have to mark the file uh, to, yeah, oh, yeah now you right. go to the it's revisions. So you see revisions? That's right. You have to mark the file, say so it's in revision. Thank you. Uh, and then you can go here, you see, you can go to restore. So you see all the different versions, you see who it's, who, who's modified it, and then you can go back to, um, to restore. Um, and if it doesn't work, that's a really useful thing about our space. The team, uh, support team are very responsive. So um, things don't always work, um, but there's someone out there to help. And that, that I find is really um, useful and reassuring. So um, let's go back into uh, another one of my examples. So let's go to teaching example two. And uh, what I wanted to show you here um, is, you know, you probably will want to have um, lab book entry templates that are slightly different for different types of, of experiments. So you see here that the general structure applies as to the previous one. I've got AIM cells, culture reagents, etc. But it's a fundamentally very different experiment. So the experimental notes um, or the information here is somewhat different as a live cell imaging experiment. So this goes back to the point that you will have to introduce to allow some flexibility in this. So don't take the point about conventions about, uh, you know, a lab book entry template as a uh, 
something that's set in stone and, and it looks exactly the same for every member, but there are certain building blocks that will have to look the same to enable uh, what I mentioned before, continuity and ease of uh, understanding of what's been going on, but then there should be some um, flexibility allowed uh, within uh, those uh, external constraints. So what if you want to share this lab book entry uh, with a collaborator and they don't have RSpace? Uh, well, you can download this um, as a, you can export it as a PDF file, a doc file, that's all fine. Um, what I find particularly useful is actually the zip bundle um, export. Um, so a HTML file can easily be opened. It just opens in the browser and you can see uh, even links, uh, etc. in that document. But also when you do this, you say next. And then here you have this option, should linked RSpace documents be included in export? And um, you, may be, you may want everything to be exported. So you say include link documents to depth infinity, um, and then uh, you say export, and eventually there will be a notification up here saying that your export is ready. So I did this uh, last evening already to show you what it looks like. So this was quite a big lab book um, entry uh, with multiple uh, links. So um, uh, it downloads as a zip, so let's unzip it. And then this is what it means that it actually uh, includes everything to depth infinity. So the um, lab book entry itself is doc R space teaching example two, uh, and then the components that were included in that lab book entry are here. But you've also got uh, information about all other things that have been um, that are linked to this lab book entry. So because I said include everything, you see lots of information here and you'll be able to find out which particular uh, what the context of these links are by opening the uh, HTML file um, of that lab book entry. So this is it and it, that, that's what it looks like. And you know you have all these files available uh, in uh, structured folders here already. So that makes it um, quite um, holistic in a way. So you have access access to everything. You don't have to uh, remember, oh, I need to download that uh, cell culture lock that, below, that was linked to this lab book entry. It just happens um, automatically. Uh, in a similar way, um, coming back to archiving or backing up on a regular basis, if you go back to uh, our space, uh, workspace and then actually my R space and then you scroll through here and you see this option um, export import okay so you click on export and then you have this option here export um, all if you want to export all your work and files click the button below so I did that earlier today because it was basically 3.2 gigs so I didn't want you to watch um, the download of that um, but basically I then get this uh, another zip file that is uh, all my R space work to date. So what I would recommend um, for a lab, um, as a perhaps as a lab rule, is to sort of have a um, to to decide on the frequency of doing this uh, export of all work, and then have a folder in the lab. So I have a one here that's R space backup, and then uh, what I oh, had opened it already. Um, then I'll take the one that's now the most recent backup and I'll put it in here and then I can uh, delete uh, the previous uh, one, which was on the 6th of February, okay? So that way I uh, also know that there is a backup to, to go back to um, in case something happen, uh, happens and the worldwide uh, web completely crashes and we can't access anything um, anymore. Um, so, um, Another thing that I mentioned uh, that I would cover is what happens if you're sitting on the train, for instance, and there is no internet access or you're on the tube in London, um, which I know you're in Edinburgh, so you won't be, but you know, if you want to work um, on a, a lab book entry or put together a protocol when you don't have access to the internet, what I tend to do is I would just open a Word file on my computer. I would uh, start jotting stuff down um, as if I'm working in our space. And then what's really useful, if we now create a new entry here, you see that you can import from Word. So you can just import that uh, document that you've just been uh, writing up as an R space entry. Alternatively, um, as was part of my teaching example here, 
sometimes you have a protocol that's maybe only just used once and um, so I'll write it up in Word and I'll just insert it as a Word file. Our space is really nice because um, it integrates with um, Office so I can open this um, in an Office uh, window and I can edit and it will save it automatically as well. So um, that is also available when it comes to Excel spreadsheets. Uh, one word of caution maybe um, based on experience is that if I'm now to clone this uh, lab book entry, um, sorry, I need to be in edit mode and then save and clone. Um, and now we go down to this seeding protocol here and now I want to modify it slightly because um, maybe I decided on a different seeding density for this experiment. So when you're in edit mode, you can edit your um, Word or Excel spreadsheet documents by clicking, let me show you again, information icon, then open in Word. Uh, let's close it here. Okay, uh, so now I'm in edit and let's just delete this. Uh, Maybe I shouldn't actually do it because it is actually linked to another <laughs> lab book entry. The point I want to make is if I edit this, it will be edited across all entry where this particular document uh, is present. OK, uh, so you will, you could go back to the previous version, obviously, via the version control, but you may not want to because you may want this particular change to be associated with this lab book entry and your original to be associated with your original lab book entry. So what I tend to do if I want to reuse this, but a slightly modified fashion, I would download it, open it in, on, in Word on my computer, make whatever changes I need to make, and then just insert it again with a changed uh, file name. Uh, quite often I like to actually put the file name of the lab book entry ID uh, at the front, and then it immediately becomes unique um, for each uh, lab book entry. I don't know if that made sense, but um, you will, <laughs> if you overwrite something uh, in, in this manner, you will quickly realize um, what I'm talking about. Um, so I think that's more or less it, to be honest. There's quite a lot of information, but uh, because it's recorded, I have confidence that if you need to revisit something, you can just scroll back through through the talk. Um, and I think maybe it's just easier to go through questions um, rather than more details. So I think yeah, I'll that's great. Thanks, Relita. I was just wondering if we could maybe go over this one question um, just to get that still in the recording. Um, there was a question in the chat about sharing protocols with uh, non R space users. Um, uh, if that's possible and how would you do that? I mean, if you showed how you can export a file, of course, but is there a way to share it so they can edit it? Uh, so, so, so yeah, the way that, so you see here, actually I have a notebook with a, for a collaboration and that's where it's uh, those other users will have to create an R space account if they were, are to actually be able to edit it directly. And then you will have to be set up as part of a group, whether it's a lab uh, lab group or, yeah, you could call it a little mini lab group for your collaboration. So that's the way you can then uh, share these things as a, as a larger group. Now, the enterprise version, I think, uh, is uh, more handy for this uh, internally within a university, for instance, because uh, you will have uh, all the groups that have our space will be visible, uh, etc. Um, so, um, yeah, it's not external people who don't have an R space account can't just get access to your entry and then start editing. Um, you have to remember that one of the things that this allows is you, you need to have this proper sort of version control and and traceability function. And for that to work efficiently, you do need to have uh, this sort of link provided by having the actual R space account. <clears throat> OK. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think there's more questions coming into the chat just now, but maybe we can just um, yeah finish up the recording here and then move to the Q and A. Nick, you think that's okay? Yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. Thanks very much, Rita. Thank you so much for this talk.